This video is sponsored by Ground News. On the 9th of November 1989, the wall that had divided the city of Berlin into the capitalist West and the communist East finally fell. Only two years later, the USSR collapsed, marking the end of the Cold War. Fast forward to the present day, and Europe remains divided into two camps the developing former communist countries in the East, and the developed former colonial powers in the West. In fact, research indicates that over the last 30 years, the average annual GDP growth rate for Eastern European countries was around 3.6%, while Western Europe recorded an average of only 2.1% during the same period. So why has the East grown so much despite its difficult start? This video unveils six key factors behind Eastern Europe's remarkable economic growth in the past 30 years. And stay tuned till the end, where we'll explore the possibility of the East surpassing the West in the future. Before we start, please subscribe, like the video, and hit the bell icon if you like this type of content and want to stay up to date with all things EU. For the purpose of this video, we'll be defining Eastern Europe according to the United Nations classification, which considers Eastern Europe as countries who are part of the Soviet bloc east of the Iron Curtain. This includes Romania, Bulgaria, Poland, Czechia, Hungary, and Slovakia. And for Western Europe, we will focus on Germany, Austria, the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, and France. So why has the East grown so quickly? Let's start with the most obvious reason, the fall of the Soviet Union. More specifically, the switch from a planned communist economy to a free market capitalist system. Let's take a look at Poland as an example. After the collapse of the USSR, the Polish post-communist government implemented the Balcerowicz Plan in 1990, which involved radical and far-reaching economic reforms. The plan was also known as shock therapy, as it aimed to swiftly transform the economy by reducing inflation, decontrolling prices, eliminating shortages, seizing subsidies to state enterprises, and liberalizing foreign trade. Yet it was not the privatization of large state-run enterprises that drove the majority of growth. Surprisingly, the true catalyst for job creation, wealth generation, and customer satisfaction emerged from the remarkable rise of thousands of new private Polish businesses. For example, let's take a look at the grocery sector. In the era before economic reforms, shopping in Poland's state-run food shops was an unpleasant and restricted experience. Products were hidden behind service counters, attended by middle-aged workers in stained smocks. Customers had to stand in queues and rely on attendants to retrieve items for them, without the opportunity to inspect them beforehand. In 1990, Semeko Okmes, a Polish company, embraced the Western supermarket concept and transformed the shopping experience. They removed service counters, allowing customers to freely browse and choose products. The introduction of Western foods added to the attraction, while the supermarket's 24-7 operating hours broke away from the conventional norms. Within just two years, Sumeco Okmes opened five stores and achieved millions of dollars in sales. Similar results were also seen with thousands of other newly formed businesses. The Balcerowicz plan initiated remarkable economic expansion, with GDP per capita skyrocketing from 2.5k in 1990 to 16k in 2020, an astonishing growth of over 530%. Additionally, exports surged from 10 billion in 1990 to 260 billion in 2020. Another reason for Eastern Europe's growth is its accession into the EU. In 2004, the EU underwent its largest expansion ever by accommodating a number of former Soviet bloc nations, such as Poland, Czechia, Slovakia, and Hungary. And in 2007, Romania and Bulgaria also joined. EU membership meant frictionless trade due to access to the EU single market, EU funding, and private investment through Western companies. Hungary is a prime example of how membership of the EU can lift a country's economy. After its accession in 2004, Hungary's GDP skyrocketed from 105 billion to 158 billion in just four years. To this day, the country remains one of the highest net beneficiaries of EU funding, netting over 3 billion euros every year. In fact, let's take a quick look at the net beneficiaries of the EU in 2021. 
As you can see, Hungary sits in third, behind only Greece and Poland. If we look at the countries we are discussing today, you can see that they all receive significant EU funds, thus helping economic growth. But to gain access to EU funds, member countries are not only expected to comply with EU's regulations, but also to uphold its foundational values. At present, Hungary's access to a staggering 13 billion euros in funds is in limbo, reflecting the current tensions within the EU. Indeed, the relationship between Hungary and the EU has reached such a critical juncture that the EU Parliament is even contemplating denying Hungary the opportunity to assume the EU presidency in the coming year. It is amidst this complex scenario that I use Ground News, an amazing news comparison platform that makes it incredibly easy to read between the lines of media bias and break free from algorithms. Ground News shows me all media sources reporting the story and their bias distribution. For instance, Euronews leans slightly left, while Le Figaro tilts slightly to the right. Just by clicking on the titles, you can read the articles with different perspectives, like this right-wing piece, more critical of the EU. Further features, like Blindspot, help you discover stories you might have missed due to bias, or My News Bias, that shows you your reading habits. All this is also accessible on your phone. I feel ground news is crucial for reducing polarization, and promoting informed decisions, which is why I use it myself. Try it out and subscribe through my link at ground.news slash EU Made Simple for a special offer of 30% of their Vantage plan. This unlocks all features for as little as 5 euros per month and also helps support this independent media venture striving for news transparency. This brings us back to our video and our third reason, foreign direct investment. FDI refers to an investment made by a company or individual from one country into a business or project located in another country. After the fall of the Soviet Union and with the integration into the European Union, Eastern Europe became very attractive for big Western companies as they had a skilled workforce, low labor costs, and favorable business environments with few unions and low tax regimes. Let's delve into Slovakia in more detail. Following the collapse of the Soviet Union, Slovakia's economy was in disarray. Its exports were predominantly centered around metallurgy, heavy engineering, and arms production, with a major portion being traded with other socialist countries. These markets were lost almost immediately after 1989, resulting in a sharp rise in unemployment to 13%. It took Slovakia a decade to rebuild its production structure and reorientate its exports towards the West. The turning point came in 1999, when Slovakia started EU accession negotiations. Slovakia had to meet economic stability requirements and adopt EU legislation to join, and foreign investors responded to the news, starting Slovakia's golden age. Foreign direct investment rose to new heights. Volkswagen started all the way back in 1991, but ramped up production significantly during the 2000s. Kia Motors in 2003. PSA in 2005, Jaguar and Land Rover in 2018, and now Volvo, starting production in 2026. Slovakia is now the biggest producer of cars per capita in the world, producing over 1 million cars per year, while only having a population of 4 million people. But this FDI influx has not been exclusive to Slovakia. As can be seen by this graph, Net FDI has increased exponentially in all of Eastern Europe over the last 20 years. Here are just some examples of companies investing into factories or offices in each of these countries. Many of the companies are known for their manufacturing prowess, but it's worth noting that Romania is home to several prominent technology giants. This leads directly to our fourth reason, growth of the IT sector. While this is evident in all of Eastern Europe, Romania is home to the most IT professionals in all of Eastern Europe. Romania's tech boom took off in the early 2000s, thanks in large part to the government offering near zero income tax rates to tech workers. However, the government also invested into educating its population. Firstly, through digital inclusion, with the aim to provide all Romanians with access to quick internet. The government supplied computers to 200,000 poor families and provided quick internet throughout the country. It worked, and today Romania is ranked number one in Europe in terms of average internet peak connection speed, and 84% of its population are internet users. 
Secondly, internet and e-learning, with the goal of developing quality online learning resources. For example, the government invested into 10 to 25 computers per school with internet access, and the student-to-computer ratio was far better than the global average. Thirdly, the Romanian government invested heavily in universities to develop IT-related programs and facilities. As a result, Romania's very own Silicon Valley, Cluj-Napoca, has emerged as a technology hub, comprising of IT companies, startups, and universities. Consequently, Romania's technology sector has witnessed a remarkable increase in contribution to GDP, rising from 4.7% to nearly 7% over the last four years. And this leads us to our number five reason, growth of Eastern European startups. Startup venture capital investments in Eastern Europe have significantly increased, reaching a peak of 3.5 billion euros in 2021, up from 0.6 billion euros in 2012. As can be seen in this map, Czechia emerged as the frontrunner in raising venture capital for startups in 2021. Thanks to its robust economy, business-friendly environment, and thriving entrepreneurial scene, Czechia also supports the growth of startups through programs like Czech Invest and Czech Accelerator, which provide financial grants, business development assistance, and opportunities for international expansion. Like Romania, Czechia invested in its own innovation hub in Brno, which already boasts the highest concentration of small and medium-sized businesses with their own research and development sites. That being said, Czechia has a thriving startup ecosystem with successful companies like Avast, Home Credit, and Kiwi.com. And studies have recognized Czechia as the second best country in Central and Northern Eastern Europe for startups, with only Estonia surpassing it. We should never discount geography either, which is our reason number seven, strategic positioning. A country's location on the world map can play a huge role in the development of its economy. And many Eastern European countries find themselves in the perfect strategic positions. Bulgaria sits at the center of a few major economic crossroads. First, its proximity to Turkey gives it access to the lucrative trading network in the Middle East. Second, Bulgaria is a massive transit and distribution hub for Russian oil and gas entering into Europe. This has greatly helped build its energy sector. And third, and perhaps most important of all, Bulgaria has two main ports, Varna and Burgas, with direct access to the Black Sea. This gives the country a highly coveted firm grasp of the trade network, connecting European markets to the rest of the world. Now let's compare the economic growth of Eastern European countries with Western EU countries. In terms of GDP, it currently looks like this, with Germany, France and the Netherlands taking the top spots. The first Eastern European country, Poland, sits in fourth. Now obviously this is an unfair comparison, as Germany has a much larger population. If we look at GDP per capita, things look a little different, with Luxembourg, Netherlands, and Austria taking the top spots. There is still a clear divide between Western and Eastern Europe, with GDP per capita dropping significantly from 33k in France to 18k in Czechia. So what about GDP growth? Will Eastern European countries be able to catch up? If we take a look at average GDP growth figures from the last 10 years, things look very different again with Eastern countries dominating the top spots. Does this mean that Eastern Europe will take over Western Europe? In our opinion, not anytime soon, as they are still well behind Western Europe. Also, growth has been quick because they were so far behind Western Europe to start with. Once they get closer, growth is likely to slow down. Not to mention, there are a lot of concerns that may hinder progress. Corruption remains a big problem. The population is aging rapidly, with fertility rates among the lowest in Europe. And brain drain remains a huge problem, with Eastern professionals going to the West. Thus, we think that there is still some time and uncertainty to what extent the East will be able to catch up, let alone leapfrog the West. A massive thank you to all the help for this video. All the contributors are listed on the screen. We really appreciate all the help with this video. And of course, we could not include all your feedback. But if there's a lot of interest, we can do deep dives into individual countries. Thank you so much for watching. And if you enjoy the content, please subscribe and like the video. And if you want to support the channel, please consider signing up to Patreon. Until next time.